Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Fran Duffy. That's right. Another week. We're back to discuss this Eagles defense as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade continues. I'm Fran Duffy. And as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 389. At the top of today's show, we've got Chalk Talk where I chat with Deontay Lee from The Athletic. And what's going to be a really fun conversation, not just about this Eagles defense, but really about the best defense in the land a year ago. The Georgia Bulldogs, obviously the Eagles selecting Jordan Davis and N'Kobe Dean from that defense here this in this draft. But what is it that made that Georgia defense go? And what lessons can we learn from that and spin that forward to this defense here in Philadelphia? I think there are some really interesting insights there from Deontay, who did an outstanding job breaking down this Georgia defense all last fall over at PFF. I listened to his podcast with Seth Galina, the Two High podcast, on a weekly basis, and just outstanding insight from those guys all throughout the fall. And so I thought, let's bring that conversation here to this podcast and just kind of talk about Dean and Davis and what they could mean for this Eagles defense here moving forward into 2022 and beyond. So really good stuff there from Deontay. We'll also talk about uh, the Eagles' newest addition in veteran cornerback James Bradbury, who the team signed in the middle of last week. We're going to talk through all of that here at the very top of the show. Before we get there, a couple of things I want to make sure we hit on. Number one, make sure you head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, wherever you listen. Leave us a rating. Leave us a question. If you've got something that you want us to hit on here in the coming weeks, now's the time. We've got a few weeks before training camp gets rolling. So if you want something to be covered here on the podcast, that is the way to reach us. Head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher. Leave us the, the comment there in the comment box, and we will get to it here on an upcoming episode. That said, let's get into our discussion here with Deontay Lee. It's time now for Chalk talk let's get down to business it's time for chalk talk Well, excited to welcome in for the very first time here on Chalk Talk on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, Deontay Lee, who does an outstanding job covering uh, the entire NFL, college football, the NFL draft for The Athletic. You could follow him on Twitter at Deontay Lee FB. Deontay, welcome to the show, man. Man, thank you for having me. Um, I think I was talking to Bo Wolf and a few of the other Eagles guys, and I was like, you know, professionally, it's great to be able to talk with guys who are really good at their jobs, and you certainly are another one on that list. And then personally, for me, this is like a dream come true true to be able to talk Eagles coverage, you know, um, on this stage with this platform, somebody, you know, in yourself that I've been following for a while, man. So I'm really excited to get into it. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, listen, I listen to you guys every single week last fall on the uh, on the Two High podcast. Yourself, Seth Galina, you did an outstanding job breaking down the, the entire sport at, at every level. And one team that you talked about uh, for good reason on a weekly basis, it seemed like was this Georgia Bulldogs defense and just a, a legendary unit, uh, one that put up just ridiculous numbers in the SEC, arguably the best defense in modern history in, in college football. Uh, and the Eagles selected two players in the first two days of the draft, two of the biggest playmakers for that team in Jordan Davis and Nicobe Dean. And so I kind of thought, who is a better person to come on and just talk through and contextualize the performance of these two guys? And, and so I guess I'll start with this. And you and I, we didn't do like any prep work for this. I wanted it to right. be a very organic conversation. And so I'll start with just this at the top. When you go, when you think back to that Georgia defense, what is it that made that go? What is it that made it as good as it was a year ago? Obviously a lot of talent at all three levels. Oh man, that's tough. If I had to whittle it down to one thing, I think it comes down to verse versatility that's mm. the thing that I think about most it's versatility in skill sets and then with the coaching staff a willingness to really lean into that versatility so whether we're talking about at the first level you know Trevon Walker Jordan Davis Devontae Wyatt these are guys who lined up anywhere and everywhere you know along the line of scrimmage and all kinds of stunts and twists and things like that um, to the second level you know guys like Channing Tindall Quay Walker and Kobe Dean all guys who were drafted right and who will probably be you know contributors early in their career being used 
used as blitzers, being used as coverage players, you know, fitting the run from the box, stepping out into space. So, you know, and then you think about a Lewis scene who kind of does everything and he was ended up being the last pick in the first round. So just that versatility, especially up the middle of the defense, I think is ultimately what the hallmark of that Georgia team was. And I think that it speaks a lot to why they were so dominant against the run and then able to finally kind of get everything together in terms of getting after the passer against Michigan and, and Alabama to secure a national title. Yeah, and you saw obviously a lot of too high structures with them on the on the back end, a lot of too high safety looks, and and obviously that's been one of the the big buzzwords around the right. NFL and, and coverage in the NFL uh, over the last twelve months or so. As you've seen more and more teams trying to dock that philosophy, the Eagles were one of them a year ago. Played a little bit more split safety than what we had seen from them in the past. When you look mm-hmm. at, at Lewis Seen and really everybody on the back end of that defense, and just the you talked about the versatility, but what is it that they did from a schematic standpoint? What was kind of the identity of that secondary? Just uh, from a coverage standpoint it's it's really interesting right i'm i'm it's really fascinating to kind of look at col- the college game in comparison to the pro game because i think what we're seeing in the college game and it's starting to leak a little bit up to the nfl are teams who are building things from back to front right yep. where coverage is dictating everything else that they want to do defensively and in georgia that certainly applies so to your point playing a lot of those two high structures like they have a they have a, a heavy belief in the ability to play two man it's not just quarters but yep. to be able to play those cover two two deep types of looks and you know if you ask people who are in the coaching world or in the football schematic world they'll tell you to fit the run out of you know those types of structures is no easy task and that you know kind of influences why they like those big bodies that they had up front so being able to play a gap and a half we've heard guys like Brandon Staley in the NFL talk about it Vic Fangio has talked about it. a lot of the guys who are from that 3-4 esque type of world have made mention of something like that and that applied to Georgia and being able to do that that interplay between eating up a gap and a half up front while also staying with two deep safeties on the back end, you know, to be able to kind of find that middle ground, not give up a bunch of explosive plays in the run game really allows you to take away an offense's ability to be explosive in the passing game. And that was kind of the hallmark of the team. So when I think about, um, you know, what they were doing on the back end and then kind of trying to spin that forward to what we see from the NFL or what we will see um, in the NFL going forward, it's going to be more of that team saying, Hey, we've got to get bigger bodies up front that can handle the run game so we can play light in the box. So we can keep, two deep safeties, you know, on the hash or in the seam to be able to take away, you know, those over routes, those post routes, you know, those those intermediate passing windows that you see some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL really punishing defenses when they leave them open. And I love that because, you know, it, and that's why I started with the secondary because I agree that everything that they want to do is all, you know, back to front. And I feel like it kind of got lost in discussion about football, about the NFL, especially is mm-hmm. that, you know, teams that play a lot of too high I, because before the Seattle cover three, the popular defensive team around the NFL was the Tampa two and yep. all those Tampa two schemes. You had undersized linebackers, you had undersized yep. defensive ends, you had yep. three technique trying to get up the field, right? You yep. still had your nose shade, but all those guys were small. But for the most part, if you're going to play too high, a lot of those teams in, in, in history were bigger up front and they would mm-hmm. be able to mm-hmm. handle uh, the, the run and allow those guys to be able to focus from a personnel standpoint uh, on the back end and coverage. And so uh, I think that that's kind of an interesting thing to kind of bring back to the forefront is, right. yeah, if you're going to play too high, you're going to play with a lot of bodies out in space. Well, those guys that are inside have to be able to hold up. Absolutely. I mean, and, and to your point, like that just kind of speaks to the cyclical nature of football, right? Um, you know, you go to do the Legion of Boom thing. This is something that I wrote with the athletic, you know, kind of chronicling de- these defensive trends changing through the lens of Pete Carroll and his run through Seattle, right? And, and when it is time to move to that kind of Legion of Boom, four down, over front, cover one and cover three world, now your defensive ends can really start tearing up the field, right? Because you're playing one on one coverage everywhere else. You're loading up the box. It's going to be hard to run the ball in between the tackles if you're good at it um, and now you can play with a little bit more athleticism and now we're starting to see that kind of trend back in the opposite direction right and a lot of that is because offenses have you know offenses will ultimately concede what you're taking away right which is to say all right well if you're not going to give us inside zone and, and a lot of these downhill runs well then we'll go to perimeter run game and then set up you know these intermediate passes off of it and that's how the Shanahan offense gets to gets the resurgence that it's had over the last half decade or so or, or full decade if you consider the time in Washington as well with, with Mike Shanahan so you see those types of things come back into play and now defenses are responding again in kind you know you want to take away those intermediate passes windows you probably want to play quarters well again now you're back in that too deep world like you said so how do you want to handle it and what we're seeing now 
in terms of like the coaches that are being hired and the way the ideas are kind of um, matriculating through the league is people coming back to, well, do we need to get back into a three, four type of structure when we're playing, you know, with our nickel package, when it's still four defensive linemen down, we still want to have a big, you know, two eyes. So a guy, you know, inside the guard and a big three technique that's lined up outside the guard to be able to handle those interior gaps. So that way we can take our linebacker if we need to and walk him out over another slot or a tight end, whatever the case may be. So that way we can stay sound in coverage. Um, and that's also, you know, as into the advent of the RPO game that makes a game more lateral, more horizontal. So yep. you do have to play more in space. So all these things just kind of layer in on, on top of one another. And that kind of creates these cascading effects schematically. And that's why I think it's so fascinating to have watched a, you know, what it was when Seattle was at the peak and that was the biggest influence in the league to now, you know, Vic Fangio's influence over the league now and the way that that's kind of spreading and it changes the context of the games that we watch watch and it changes the kind of body types that that people prioritize which ultimately just affects the way that we um interface with the league in general yeah and i, I think t- then when you then look at wh- who are the you talked about the body types like if you look at the guys that are coming from college to the nfl and when i'm thinking about it from like an nfl draft standpoint it almost becomes like okay uh defensively at the second level at the third level and really off the edge as well it'll, it'll take those guys mm-hmm. you know you talk about trevon walker uh you know and those guys from that defense I look at it as like, okay, well, you either need guys that are going to be role players and they do one specific thing really, really well, and we're going to put them in to certain packages that fit that skill set, or like you said at the very top, the versatility. And it's like, okay, right. well, in this package, you're going to do this. In this package, you're going to do this. In this package, you're going to do that. And I feel feel like we saw, if you go back and look at this Eagles defense a year ago, that's where I feel like it kind of, things got kind of lost in the weeds a little bit. It's like, oh, well, when Brandon Graham got hurt, what does that mean for the defensive front? Okay, well, that changed okay. roles for Josh Sweat. It changed roles for Milton Williams. It changed right. roles for Fletcher Cox, right? And right. because in all those different packages, all those guys are doing different things. Brandon Graham was able to line up all over the place. Milton Williams lines up all over the place. And just getting back to Georgia, it's that same kind of deal. And those guys were able to stay healthy, thankfully, for their part. But uh, it's that, that versatility is so important. But also finding those specific skill sets is a huge benefit as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest thing now in, in the NFL, and you know, I always kind of speak in analogies with sports, but the same thing is happening in the NBA, right? Yep. Which is that all these body types are starting to change. It's not just, hey, we want a guy that's this height and this weight playing point guard or this height and this weight playing small forward. It's can we start to flatten some of these, you know, some of these height and weight distributions, you know, when we're talking about how we want to defend teams, how we want to be able to be versatile and, you know, make sure we don't have any mismatches. And I think that the NFL, because offenses are just becoming so adaptive, depth at generating explosive offense you have to kind of concede as a defensive coach and say hey it's not enough to just say we want one star or we're building our entire defense off of the identity of hey let's get a star pass rusher and that's all we need and and we'll build the rest of the way through there that's not to say that that's not valuable because it certainly is you know we saw basically the Rams end um, the Bengals bid to try to tie the game up in the end you know because of Von Miller and Aaron Donald in the second half so that still has its value but it's more like again as you layer these defenses or layer these things schematically and in terms of personnel that versatility becomes more and more important because you have to be able to address all the different things that offenses can do to generate explosive plays whether it's rpos play action you know your max protection deep shots um your outside zone plays like they're we are in an era now where almost every offense can get to whatever type of identity, quote unquote, they need to on a week by week basis. And that forces a defense to be the same level of malleable, you know, and versatile. Mm-hmm. And you need to get body types that can carry those roles out, you know, on a week by week basis. And we saw that with this Georgia team you know, at the second level. When you talk about uh, Nicobe Dean, you get to Quay Walker, who did so many different things for that defense. Uh, and then you get to Channing Tindall as well. When you talk about Nicobe Dean, uh, and you know, I, you obviously talked about him a ton, not just in the fall, but in the spring leading up to the mm-hmm. draft. He ends up falling and goes to the Eagles in the third round. What exactly did he mean to that defense? And you almost can like split that up both to like tangibles, like how he was used. And then obviously the intangibles, we know it was uh, the guy that kind of was the Pied Piper for that entire group. But uh, what did he bring exactly to that defense in your mind? You know, it's funny when I think about Nicobe Dean and I, I kind of tease myself for this all the time, but for some reason, watching him brings like all the coaching platitudes out of me. Right. <laughs> when you hear like sideline to sideline player, like people throw that around a lot. That certainly applies. That actually applies with a guy like Nicobe Dean. And we're and a lot of that is because of what he's able to do above the neck. Right. It, it's pre snap being able to identify things like, OK, in this formation, we think a motion might be coming this way. If we get that motion, that means that the one run that they really like 
like off of this is X. So the second I see the guard or the center turn this way, I know where I need to be. And I'm going to be where I'm going to be where the ball is going, you know, instantly um, to things like, hey, you know, I can tell by this offensive lineman stance that he's about to pass that. So I know that I need to get to my drop and out of this formation, the passes that we get are X, Y and Z. So let me be prepared for that. And he's obviously, you know, been able to execute that. And then I think about, you know, one of my favorite plays of his. I think everybody thinks of that Michigan play where you get that wide swing screen out yeah. by the sideline and he goes from basically the numbers on one end to outside the numbers on the opposite to make the tackle in the backfield. But I think my favorite play of his was against Florida right before halftime where Florida splits a, splits the running back out in the yep. empty. He becomes a number one wide receiver out there. Any other linebacker in those situations is probably panicking, right? Like, oh my goodness, I'm on an island. I hope this guy doesn't run vertically. I don't know what route I'm going to get. I'm never out here. This is a very uncomfortable position for me. And he plays perfectly in his technique. Running back runs like a little hitch or curl route. He jumps it and takes it back to the house. And that was when I was like, okay, that speaks to, again, that level of comfort. And you only get that comfort because of your mental preparation. Yep. The best athletes can get out there in the deep water and start drowning, right? The guys who are able to live in, you know, being tested all these different ways. It's all about what they're able to do mentally. And I think that he's probably the best mind in this draft that we had when it comes to diagnosing plays and making sure that everybody, every piece of the puzzle is where it needs to be. Um, and then intangibly, obviously, every Georgia player and Georgia coach speaks to it. He was absolutely the emotional leader, you know, the intellectual leader. You know, he was a guy that Kirby Smart and Dan Lanning trusted to change the call if he saw something that he didn't like or saw something that he did like. And I think that that speaks to for a guy like Kirby Smart, who has worked with the greatest of the greatest defensively to take a guy and say, hey, if you don't like what I'm saying or if you think I'm an idiot right now, you go fix this for me. And I trust you to be a coach on the field. And I think that that's a big reason why the Eagles are excited to get him. Him, you know, and health permitting, I think that we'll see some of the same types of things for him um, in Philadelphia very early in his career. Yeah, I mean, you said it at the the, the very first thing you said in terms of uh, all the coaching platitudes, and you talked about it a little bit throughout on that the pick six against Florida uh, and and the play against Michigan on that swing screen where he's going uh, from sideline to sideline a guy that just trusts his training and trusts his technique, like mm -hmm. uh, over and over and over he's put in these positions where like, yeah, like uh, this guy just trusts what he sees and goes, it wasn't always right. There were some plays right. where it looked bad, but that's, a, that's okay. Or right. If right. you're going to make it some kind of, you know, you're able to come back and make some of the plays that he did. So uh, just talking about Nicobe Dina and what he means, let's now continue to spin this forward to Jordan Davis uh, and a guy mm -hmm. that obviously was a, a top 15 pick in this draft, uh, a highly debated, a highly discussed player throughout the course of the pre-draft process. I mean, take us through from like your first impressions to Jordan Davis and, and how that changed over the course of his career. And certainly what he did last year, obviously, you know, winning a, a number of different awards over right. the course of his final season. I will say, I mean, one thing, and I, it, it sounds reductive and I, and I understand why some people may roll their eyes and they hear it, but I do believe like in the planet theory stuff, when people talk yep. about football, right. That there are just certain guys that you don't get an opportunity to have on your roster very often. And when you talk about a guy who, who's six, six, 340 pounds, and not only runs a sub five second 40 but a sub four eight forty we're talking about rarefied air and that's that's only one of the athletic testing metrics that he kind of blew out of the water his broad jump is crazy for his size his vertical jump is crazy for his size you know if you would you know i i don't remember if he ran the three cone or not but i'm sure if he did that would have been a ridiculous time for his body density as well so again we're talking about rarefied air athletically and then you when you put it on tape you know your big concern with that is hey is he just a testing monster you know is he able to go and apply that to, to to playing on the field and you see that he can and it's not just hey I'm coming out of my stance and I'm moving forward and that's all I can do it's being able to execute some intricate stunts and twists you know whether he's the guy kind of picking guys and taking guards or tackles out of protection or out of the blocking scheme so somebody else can be free or if the stun or twist is designed for him and he's able to show that agility coming out of his stance and looping you know or spiking into a gap and then the ability to kind of finish to pursue and get to the football again Again, at that size, it's extremely rare to see a guy put his foot in the ground. Hey, the ball is moving laterally away from me, and I'm going to go chase it down with the great angle and go make a football play. And you see that against Arkansas. You see that against Florida. You saw that against Alabama in the national title game. Um, I think that, you know, 
in every way that you can think about him as a run defender. He checks every box and then some. And I think that as a pass rusher, you know, I still think that there's a lot to get out of him. You know, I, I think one of the things with Georgia that makes it hard to evaluate these guys up front is because they use their linebackers as blitzers so much. Yep. It kind of takes away from allowing your defensive linemen to really pin their ears back and get after the quarterback. But if you watch his hand usage, again, his explosiveness off the ball and just how heavy his hands are and how well he can drive and bull rush at worst as a pocket pusher, he's going to be excellent at that. Even if he doesn't generate a lot of hits on the quarterback or a lot of sacks, there, there's a value in being able to push the pocket in general. And even if he's not prepared to do so, because the Eagles already have a couple of pretty good, you know, a, a good interior pass rushers anyways, and Fletcher Cox, you know, and Hargrave. So I, I think that you can do a lot with a guy like Jordan Davis. And I think that he specifically fits what the Eagles need, which is another big body on the interior. When you need to get into those three down fronts, when you need to get into your bare fronts and really kind of anchor down against the run game, when you think that's what's coming and he's going to be able to do that and create a lot of production in the backfield because of it. I did want to continue to kind of contextualize the the lack of production because obviously that's been the big knock on him. You know, he had two sacks last year as a senior. He had one sack in the COVID shortened season in 2020. He had two and a half sacks in his sophomore year, right? So mm -hmm. never more than two and a half over the course of his career. But I mean, Devontae Wyatt was a first round pick. He had two and a half sacks last year as the, right. the three techniques next to Davis. Trayvon Walker went first overall. He had six sacks last year uh, and that was his career year, right? And so mm -hmm. you look at, at, the, mm -hmm. at this defense and guys that weren't overly productive. So it wasn't just Davis and you talked about how they incorporated Nicobe Dean and Quay Walker and Tyndall often as blitzers uh, you alluded to earlier the, the amount of stunts that they ran I don't have the number in front of me but I'm pretty sure it was like they were third in in the power five in stunts and right. twists last year so a, a right. high level of stunts and twists so it's not not every pass rush snap for him is created equal it's not he's not asked to just get upfield and get after right. the quarterback right absolutely and then you know and to that point this is one of the things that I think that maybe fans or consumers of the game have to understand when we start talking about, um, you know, evaluating prospects, which is that NFL guys are scouting traits, right? Not yep. stats. You have to turn on the film and see what he looks like when he's doing what he's doing, because all a, all sex aren't created equal. All pressures aren't created yep. equally. You know, all these snaps are not equal. These, these things don't exist in a vacuum. You have to understand whether or not the guy is executing what's being asked of him. And you're not going to turn on the tape and see Jordan Davis, you know, freestyle or not getting to the gap he's supposed to get to, or, you know, having poor effort. You know, I, I don't think that the lack of sacks is for lack of effort is, is what I would really say. And again, if you watch him, you see that he has a hand usage and you see the explosiveness. And I think that, you know, if you want to get into some, some of the exotic fronts, you know, one of the things that we saw with the Rams, you know, Sebastian Joseph Day is not a high sack guy when he was playing with the Rams, but he had a pretty good pass rush win rate. You know, when I was at PFF, it was something that I kept my eye on. And a lot of that is because they were able to get into some exotic fronts where you can almost guarantee that your, that your interior guys are going to get one-on-one -on -one pass rush scenarios and if you do that even if again you're not making contact with the quarterback if you are crushing the pocket and moving him off the platform that's production too it just yeah. does not go as cleanly on a stat sheet as you would like for it to and I still think that he can finish get to the quarterback and get some sacks you know but I, I'm interested to see kind of what his usage is going to be on those second and longs on those third and obvious passing situations and to see what Jonathan Gannon actually has planned for him as a pass rusher because because they can slow play it if they need to, or they can drop them right in and say, hey, we want you to be a big piece of some of the more exotic fronts we might want to run when, you know, when we think we're getting these obvious passing situations. So I'm really fascinated to see what he can do. But generally, in terms of the film, he has all the traits that you want to see out of a nose tackle type as a pass rusher. Is he going to be a 12 sack guy? Probably not. That would be I think that would be a little um, generous to believe uh, of the guy, but he can certainly be a high pass rush win rate percentage type of guy and a guy who can generate some pressure some cleanup pressures and, and things like that. I think people, when you're talking about Jordan Davis and a guy that size and a guy that just looks the way he does, you know, people, I mean, you go to the, the, the traditional tropes of like, oh, well, right. you know, people are always going to slide his way and oh, he's, he's mm -hmm. going to keep the linebackers clean. And of course, some of that is true, but you know, the, the usage element that you touched on is just so, so important. I, I'm forgetting the game right now. I believe it was Georgia tech. It was like a second and 10, but it was an early down blitz um, where they did like a cross dog pressure. He's lined up as a yep. nose and he slides outside as a contained player. And they, they work both linebackers and they don't come in free it was uh yep. walker and uh and dean both got free for, for the sack but it's like yeah like that that's a pass rush snap 
but he's basically just containing there. He's mush rushing right. and making sure the quarterback doesn't get out the back door. And more and more of those plays show up, the more film you go through uh, on this player. And so, again, it just kind of gets to something we talk about all the time over on the Journey of the Draft podcast when it comes to like mm-hmm. college players to the NFL is it, just because a guy wasn't asked to do something in college doesn't mean that he can't do it in the NFL. Right. Tight ends blocking, running backs catching the ball out of the backfield, corners playing in press. Like it's you can start going through all of that, all the different positions. And you, the Eagles hope clearly that Davis is one of those guys at this spot. Absolutely. And I think that they have, again, they have enough around them. This is not an unhealthy ecosystem for a guy who needs to kind of, who may still need to grow as a pass rusher to live in. Right. I still think that there's a lot to be gained from him. And to your point about that cross dog pressure, like again, for the people who watch, like it's important to understand that that's a plus rep for Jordan Davis. Right. Right. Even though he is not the guy who is going to be credited with the pressure, a sack or anything that goes on the stat sheet, you're not going to see it on a PDF. It does not mean that he did not contribute to the play. And that's one of the things that we always have to think about, particularly with defensive interior guys. You know, when you hear again, those platitudes of, Hey, he can make a, he can affect the game without registering a single uh, stat. Right. And you hear that a lot with um, the nose tackle in Tampa Bay, whose name is escaping. Yeah. Vita Vea. He's, he's a great, another great example of that right doesn't really log that many tackles you know if any in a game but you can turn you can turn on the film and see every time that he is on the field teams cannot run the ball in between the tackles because of what he does and if he's on the field you know Sebastian Joseph Day again I use as a pass rush example a guy who's not going to have more than four four to six sacks in a year he has a great pass rush run rate and every time he wins a rep that makes it that much harder to slide the protection to Aaron Donald to slide the protection you know to to Avon Miller if he's there you know that that those are the types of things that that are important and that add value to the defense I I think that that's an important piece to look at not just what a guy is individually but what he adds and what he multiplies for what you want to do you know in the full scope of who you are defensively and a guy like Jordan Davis makes your linebackers better he makes your DBs better because a guy like him can eat up those gaps and now your linebackers don't have to fit the run as fast it makes them makes it easier for them to recognize play action or flow with the football it keeps your safeties high and deep so that way they don't have to trigger down and run support in the boxes often you know, because your guys up front can really win on the first level. And the more you can do to win on the first level, the more value you get out of your second and third level players. And that's exactly what the draft pick of Jordan Davis was set out to accomplish, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, clearly a guy that they hope is a force multiplier to, the, to exactly what you said. Uh, now, you mentioned guys at the third level. And I, first, the outstanding stuff there, breaking down Georgia's defense. Last week, uh, the Eagles uh, made headlines going out yep. uh, and signing James Bradbury, the corner from the New York Giants, uh, who was released a, a week ago. So uh, I want to kind of quickly get your thoughts on Bradbury and how you feel he could fit into this defensive ecosystem that you referred to. Now it's being built in Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for my first reaction when I started seeing the reports out of New York was just like perplexed. <laughs> like I was completely right. perplexed. I was like a guy. I'm not saying that he's an all pro, but usually a guy that good is not being shopped as hard as he, it has seemed like he was being shopped, you know, by by uh, New York's new regime. Um, and then for them to just release him and not be able to find a trade partner through the draft or leading up to the draft really kind of blew me away as well. This is not a guy who's coming off of like some torn Achilles or, you know, blew out his ACL, MCL and LCL in one play or something, you know, wild or catastrophic like that. And then you turn on the tape and, you know, it made me question whether or not I was watching him the right way. And then I turn on the tape and I'm like, no, he's still the exact same player that I thought he was coming into New York, leaving Carolina to go there. And, you know, and, and in that, I mean that he's a guy who can play a little bit of man, but you can use any zone scheme in the world with him and he can execute it just fine. So whether it's a cover three, whether it's quarters, whether it's a cover two or a combination of quarters and cover two, right? It's, you can play those cover six concepts and live in that. So I think that he's a scheme versatile guy. And for what I think that we've learned of Gannon, which is that he's willing to throw anything at the wall to make it work for the defense. And I think that we've continued to get quotes from players, coaches and front office members that have kind of hinted at, hey, we really want to lean into that versatility. We really want to lean into being able to get into whatever front or whatever coverage structure or run whatever pressures are needed, you know, to get the job done. I think that we saw that in the second half of the year. And I think that it was successful for them in a way that they really want to continue to lean into it 
And if you want to be really versatile up the middle of the defense, it does require having corners that can stand up in one-on-one coverage when they need to, and guys who are versatile enough to be able to carry out different roles when you want to start using those looks to disguise different things. And Bradbury is perfect for that. I, do I think he's going to be some super number one corner, all pro level player? No, but I don't think that you need that for what else the defense has in Philadelphia right now. And again, you know, when you start putting him in combination with everything else that this defense has, I think that they're going to be much better against the run and that's going to help them against the play action game, which was a big concern for them and why I think they played coverage the way that they did last year. And the better you get against that, the harder it is to generate explosive plays and the harder it is for an offense to generate explosives, the better you get, you know, overall as a defense. So I think that he's going to be a major contributor to that uh, philosophy. You know, the, the, the ability to stop the explosive plays, that's like the number one thing for defensive coaches all around the NFL. And, uh, you right. know, obviously so much has been talked about with this Eagles offense. What is that going to look like here this fall? You know, we saw the, basically the tail of two halves last year where they were very, very pass heavy early, very run heavy late. Mm -hmm. defensively they underwent a very similar transformation where you saw right. uh, a lot of, you know, loose zone coverage early and then more tight man, more pressure yep. a little bit late, more a lot they, more so, pressure late. No, yeah. no question. And so like, I think now you got to paint that picture too, looking at this defense here into 2022, what will they look like? What will their identity be? And with all these additions we've talked about today, you look, throw in Hassan Reddick, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very fun to be able to watch yeah. this unit perform here this fall. Absolutely. I think that my, my, my closing thought really is that I think that the greatest learning, the greatest lesson learned from last year from Philadelphia is that I feel like that entire coaching staff accepts the fact that you cannot win just one way in today's NFL, yep. right? If you can, you can come in with all the ideologies and, and philosophies that you want based on your successes in different places or your belief system. But at the end of the day, you do what you have to do, not what you want to do. Right. And I think that they kind of learned that and made adjustments throughout, throughout the year. And I think what they walked away from it with is like, hey, we don't want to abandon any of the things that worked because all the things that worked for them last year did not necessarily fit, you know, your typical type of progression, right? Where, hey, maybe we start with inside run and then start throwing in counters, et cetera, et cetera. That willingness to kind of take from whatever it is that you need to in the playbook to get it done. I think that was a big piece of why they were able to, you know, squeeze their way into the playoffs last year. And I think it's going to be a big piece of future success for them is trying to find as many different ways to win as possible. And I think that their additions this offseason and all kind of speak to that type of belief system. No question. Well, Deontay, this has been awesome, man. Everybody out there, make sure you go follow Deontay on Twitter at Deontay Lee FB. Check out all of his work over at The Athletic. Can't wait to see all the analysis stuff, whether it's uh, via podcasts, via articles, uh, everything moving forward over there on that platform. So Deontay, thanks again so much for joining us here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. Thank you, friend. Just outstanding stuff there from Deontay. Everything I hoped that conversation would be and more. Just great stuff. Again, make sure you go follow Deontay on Twitter and check out all of his great work over at The Athletic. Uh, real quick, want to make sure we acknowledge a comment we got over on Apple Podcasts. Andy from Connecticut jumped on, left a five-star review, just saying that this podcast uh, is the best in the business. So, Andy, thanks so much for the five-star review. Again, if you've got a question, if you've got a comment on the show, if you've got an idea for something you want us to cover here on an upcoming podcast, that is the best way to reach us. Head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen and can leave a comment, leave that in the comment box. We will get to it here on an upcoming episode. Excited to keep going forward here. Uh, I'm hoping to have some coaches on, college and NFL here in the coming weeks to talk through this Eagles team, the new additions, and also just football in general. So make sure you stay tuned, stay subscribed right here to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I'm Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week.